People have always wanted eternal life and everlasting youth. And since the dawn of civilization, many have sought immortality, thus far without success, and sometimes even with tragic consequences. Take Qin Shi Huang. He was the first emperor of the Qin dynasty in China over 2,000 years ago. He was a very wealthy and powerful man. Uh, for example, he ordered the construction of the terracotta army to protect his mausoleum. And he tried to achieve immortality by taking these pills that were crafted by the physician corpses of the time. Unfortunately for him, the key ingredient in those pills was mercury, which we now know is toxic, and so sadly and ironically, he died of mercury poisoning. But the reason I mention him is that this quest for immortality, this desire for eternal life, has not diminished since then. We still want to live longer, and we don't want the degenerative aspects of aging or the ill health or the age-related diseases. In fact, in our modern societies, most of us will die of age-related diseases. But what I'll tell you today is that this quest is more timely than ever, because now we know we can manipulate and retard the process of aging in animals, and the next step is to do so in humans. And the reason I'm optimistic that we can do this is, in the far past few decades, we discovered that the process of aging is surprisingly plastic in animals. That means we can accelerate aging and we can retard aging, in particular at the genetic level. So, over 20 years ago, the first gene was discovered that could regulate aging, and this was done in C. elegans. These are, are tiny roundworms that live in the soil. They live only a few weeks. And since then, there's been hundreds of genes identified that can regulate aging in worms, sometimes even with massive effects. So the current record is a tenfold life extension. That is, a single gene that you manipulate in worms, and they live several months instead of a few weeks. And uh, this impact of aging means that we now know of hundreds of genes that can regulate aging in other animals as well, including fruit flies, yeast, and even in mammalian models. So we now know of multiple genes that can extend lifespan in mice. So the current record is about 50% life extension. Now, that's not as impressive as in worms, but it would still be remarkable if we could apply that to humans. So we would mean people living over 150 years. And what is fascinating about this is that you disrupt a gene or you tweak with a gene slightly in the mice, and they live 50% longer. But what is important is that these animals are not just living longer in a period of decrepitude. They are living longer in a period with health. So physiological aging is retarded, and age-related diseases are being postponed, which is what we would like. So this would be like a 75-year-old person with the health of a 50-year-old. And we now know of dozens of genes, even in mice, that can retard the process of aging, they can impact significantly on aging. So some of them are related to metabolism, others are related to hormones, and others are related to DNA repair, because one of the reasons why we age is because our DNA, our genes, accumulate damage and mutations with age, um, and so there's systems, there's genes and processes to protect the genome from damage, which in turn modulate aging. Now, of course, these are model systems, but what about humans? Now, of course, we cannot genetically engineer humans like we can animals. But we also know that genetics has a strong impact on how long we live. So this is Jean Calma. She, uh, the oldest person on record, she lived to be 122. And she's actually a great example of the impact of genetics. There's, there's a wonderful anecdote that uh, as she consecutively beat longevity records, she became a bit of a celebrity. And so every year on her birthday, journalists would flock to her house in the south of France, and they would ask her, Madame Calman, what's the secret for your longevity? And she started to become a bit fed up with it. And so uh, one year when she was uh, 115, say, and they asked her the question, she said, well, the reason I live to be 115 is that I stopped smoking when I turned 110. And there is some truth to that, in the sense that she actually smoked until very late in her life. Uh, not for, and she stopped smoking not for health reasons, but um, because her eyesight was getting worse and she was afraid she might hurt herself eating the cigarette. And she was also very fond of port wine from my hometown in Portugal, and she ate lots of chocolate. So not, not a healthy lifestyle you would associate with the longest person on record. And she's not a unique case. There's, uh, when you look at centenarians, most of them do not have a healthy lifestyle. And so there must be genetic factors involved. And we also know that from studies in families. So we, there, we know there are families in which longevity is strong. 
And we also know, for instance, that you can calculate uh, the correlation between the longevity of siblings, in particular with twins. And what the studies tells us is that longevity normally has a moderate impact from genetics. However, the genetic impact on longevity increases with age. That is, it's much stronger in centenarians like Madame Calma. So what that means for us is that if you want to be a healthy 70 or 80 year old, then you have to watch your lifestyle. You have to eat right and uh, exercise regularly and don't smoke and follow your mother's advice on this, really. But if you want to be a centenarian and live maybe 120 years, then it's really down to your genes. Now, unfortunately, most of us will not have the genes um, the same way as Jean Calma, and so we're not programmed to live as long. So what I would like to know is, what are these genes? Unfortunately, um, in the past um, 10 years or so, there has been a massive progress in technologies to sequence DNA. So the cost of sequencing DNA massively dropped in the past 10 years or so. So if you wanted to sequence your genome, for instance, so sequence all of the over 20,000 genes and billions of letters in your DNA, it would now cost you less than $2,000. So we're taking advantage of these technologies to study the genomes of centenarians and to try to understand which genes are important for their longevity. Now, unfortunately, we still don't know which those genes are. But we have made some insights from sequencing the genomes of folks that even live longer than Jean Calma. And I'm not talking, of course, about other animals. Because one of the most fascinating aspects about aging is that it, its pace actually varies tremendously across species. So, Mice, they live up to three or four years. And they age at the physiological level about 25, 30 times faster than human beings. And no matter how well you take care of a mouse, it's going to age way, way faster than a human being. So there has to be genetics, there has to be in DNA instructions that determine that. And likewise, so rhesus monkeys, for instance, they can live over 40 years. Well, elephants can live over 70 years. And on the other end of the spectrum, we have whales that can live longer than human beings. And we have even some species, so not mammals, be uh, because all of them, as far as we know, age. But we have some species, like some species of turtles and fishes, that appear not to age at all. Or maybe they age so slowly that this is not noticeable to us. And so there has to be some genetic factor to this. Uh, and that is what I would like to find out. And in order to do this, there's two animals I'm particularly interested in. And the first one is the naked mole rat. And I'm interested in these animals, uh, not just because they're beautiful, uh, but <laughs> firstly, because they're the longest lived rodent. So they can live over 30 years, which is incredible for a small uh, mouse-like uh, animal. But what's most fascinating about them is that they're extremely cancer resistant. So in hundreds of animals kept in captivity thus far, cancer has not been detected. So they are extremely cancer resistant when compared to other rodents and even when compared to humans. And now we actually know that, for example, their cells secrete a sugar that protects them from cancer. So we're understanding the tricks that these animals use to resist disease and to live so long. Now, the other animal that we're interested in is the bowhead whale. And these are the second uh, largest animal on Earth after the blue whale, and they've been estimated to live over 200 years. Now, of course, whales don't throw birthday parties or have ID cards, so the way we estimate the age of these animals is using biochemical indirect methods. But there is clear evidence that these animals live longer than human beings. And of course, they live longer than us in the wild. We know hospitals or doctors or port wine and chocolate. So there must be mechanisms intrinsic to these animals to allow them to live so long and to resist disease. And this is true, in particular in the context of cancer. So if you think about cancer, cancer is really one rogue cell that just proliferates uncontrollably. So animals like whales that have a thousand times more cells than human beings, they must have, all things being equal, a much higher chance of developing cancer than us. But they don't, otherwise they wouldn't live so long. So clearly they must have tumor protectant mechanisms that we don't have. And so in order to understand why they live so long and why are they protected from diseases like cancer, we sequence the genome of these animals. And then what we do is we compare the genome of the bowhead whale to other cetaceans like the killer whale and the minke whale, and we compare it to other mammals, including to humans. And then what we try to do is we try to identify genes in the bowhead whale that have changes that you don't find in other mammals. Because actually, mammalian genomes are not that different from each other. But we can identify specific changes in genes in the bowhead in 
genes that we know are related to DNA repair and longevity and cancer that we think are responsible or are important in their long lifespan and disease protection. And we have a number of candidates already. Now, unfortunately, we cannot, of course, study whales in the laboratory. I'm sure my head of the department would never agree to that. Um, but what we can do is we can do studies in cells. And what we can also do is we can even take genes from the bowhead whale and study them in cells from mice or in cells from humans, or even take genes from the bowhead whale and make a mouse with the gene from the bowhead whale. And what I would like to do is I would like to create a mouse that is, for instance, resistant to cancer thanks to genes from the bowhead whale. And this is a new approach in biomedical research, because typically scientists study disease models. And I'm interested in studying disease-resistant animals and trying to understand which genes and processes they use to protect against disease. And so we are now in a stage where we know that the process of aging can be manipulated. We know that from animal models. And there's no reason to think otherwise of human aging. And by understanding the genetic regulation of aging, and in particular by understanding the tricks used by centenarians like Jean Calmin and by whales and naked mole rats, we can then apply that knowledge, for example, by creating drugs that mimic the effects of genes from the bowhead whale. We can apply that knowledge to all of us to make us resistant to diseases and to live longer and healthier lives. Thank you. <laughs>